uh, offensive. Jesus is the rock of offense. And uh, he was telling his disciples that in the world, their world would hate them because they're going to hate the very things that they speak about Jesus Christ. They hated the things that Jesus spoke about the way and the truth and the life. So he's preparing his uh, disciples at the end of the 15th chapter and at the beginning of the 16th chapter for the persecution that would come. It's kind of a, the, the two chapters transition right into one another. It's a very smooth shifting, like an automatic transmission. It just shifts right in there beautifully. The first 11 verses of this 16th chapter, he's going to shift into the, the work of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to show us that the Holy Spirit has a job to do down here, which is to reprove the world. So we were working our way in that direction last week. We had talked about uh, in verse 2 where he explained, he said, look, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. The, the time will come that whoever killeth you will think he's doing God's service. And so he explained, you're going to be persecuted by the world. And the cause of their uh, persecution is going to be because they don't know the Father. They have not known the Father nor me. That's the reason they're doing it. And they even think they're doing God a service. So he wanted to let you know they're going to do this and because the, the, they don't know God, they don't know me, and they think they're doing God a service, but it's not the God that's my Father. And they're not doing me a service. And so we saw historically the persecution of the Jews against the early church beginning with Saul of Tarsus and the other Jewish leaders until 70 AD. Then we saw the spiritual application of who would put you out of synagogues. Well, it's not synagogues anymore. It's just putting you out altogether. And Christians were put out by the Roman Empire. And we looked at those persecutions. And then when the Roman Empire fell, the quote-unquote Holy Roman Empire ascended. And no longer was there an emperor. Now there was a pope. And the devil's millennium of 1,000 years of papal reign on the earth and all the persecutions that they did to Christians, true Bible-believing, born-again Christians. And then after that, we saw Islam and the ascendancy of Islam and their war against Christians and who they call infidels. And they include Jews too. We saw, so historically, we saw spiritual application. Now doctrinally, just to show you at the very end, doctrinally, and I brought that uh, this week, I remembered it. Here's the Messianic Perspectives, and here is the uh, article called The Anti-Missionaries, Who They Are and What They Believe, a new group called Jews for Judaism. Doctrinally, they will put you out of the synagogues. There's a time coming in the future where the synagogues, people will be put out of the synagogues. Who will be put out of the synagogues? The Jews will go around and find anyone that believes that Yeshua is the Messiah and they'll be put out of synagogue. So doctrinally, this is going to be happening as we approach the end days and the time of Jacob's trouble. So, so we saw those verses last week and we went through them and uh, it was a blessing learning those things. Why? Because we're forewarned. So we are forearmed. So Jesus says in verse four, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, <laughs> you may remember <laughs> that I told you of them. It's not a surprise to us. Are you surprised if you're treated a certain way by the world because you are a Bible-believing, born-again Christian and you're willing to stand for those beliefs and say, I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and the only way to the Father and no one comes to the Father but by Jesus Christ. Oh, you're just so narrow-minded. And you face persecution because of that. Well, we're not surprised. Our Jesus warned us it would be like this. See, Christ's disciples know these things. A lot of Christians don't because they never get discipled. That's why I want to take the time to study the Word of God. So many Christians, they get saved and then they never look into the Word and there's a lot of truths in here. And Jesus says, I've told you these things. You'll remember them. And when the time comes, you won't be surprised because I've already told you. Uh, verse 4, And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. And we saw historically he protected the flock for three years. But now he's going to let it grow up. Uh, spiritually in your life, he protected you in the beginning of your Christian walk. He protected me. And a lot of battles did not come my way early on. He was protecting me. He was letting me grow. But then he let the battles come. But by the time he let them come, I had studied enough Bible to know these things are going to happen. So I wasn't surprised. Verse 5, But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask uh, me, 
asketh me, whither goest thou? Now, he's talking, I'm going to go my way unto him that sent me. I'm, I'm going to go to the Father, the one that sent me. I do the work of him that sent me. I do the work of my Father at all times. I do all things that please my Father. He says, none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? Now, that's strange, because if you back up to the 13th chapter, <clears throat> when they are first beginning this entire evening together. Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 are all one evening. It's the evening of the Last Supper. They're all together in one discourse. And when the evening begun, at the very start, when they were first getting the table ready and getting prepared, Jesus washed their feet and told them to do likewise. And, uh, and then he said, uh, verse uh, 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And Jesus said, The greatest thing I want is for love to flow through you. That's what, that's what we need as Christians. We need God's love to flow through us. Not our love, not the emotional, sappy, worldly love that we have. We need God's love flowing through us. We need to be a vessel for God's love. So he's training them and teaching them and preparing them to get ready and to ask for. Remember, always ask. You have not because you ask not. All right? That's one of the problems we have down here. We need to ask for the Holy Spirit. I do this on a daily basis. And you need to do the same thing. Ask so God's love can flow through you, so we can love one another. Now, after he tells them this, look what Peter says in verse 36. Then Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Whither goest thou? Now, he had just said in the 16th chapter, um, verse 6, uh, no, verse 5, I go my way unto him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? And then you just read there in the 13th chapter, verse 36, Lord, whither goest thou? So the exact same three words. Now, why would Jesus say that nobody asked me, whither goest thou, when you just read that somebody asked him, whither goest thou? Do you want to know the answer to this? <laughs> sure. Okay. You know what the answer is? The answer is found way back in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. We've looked at it before. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. According to the outward appearances, looking at it, it seems to me like the question's been asked. But according to the heart, the question was not properly asked. Is, is, this is getting deep, folks. We're get, yeah, we're getting deep. You, you feel like you're swimming over your head? <laughs> the waters were first up to my knees, then over my head, and I was swimming in them like in Ezekiel. Okay, here's what... This is a hard thing for you and I to get, so let's just slow down and meditate for a second. The Lord looks on our hearts. The Lord looks on our hearts on more than what we do. The Lord looks on our hearts on more than what we say. Peter just said the right words, okay? But according to the heart, it wasn't right with God. <laughs> for example, you can say... The very words that Jesus taught in Matthew, I think it's chapter 6, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You can recite the Lord's Prayer word for word, and Jesus would be able to look at you and said, You know, nobody really said the Lord's Prayer today. Nobody said, Whither goest thou? Because he looked at the heart. Now let me show you Peter's heart, and let me show you the heart that Jesus was looking for. Because Peter's heart... When he asked that question, was not the right heart. In other words, I hate to say this phrase, but you hear it sometimes with the super saints, your heart's not right with God. But, but Jesus has kind of shown us right here that when Peter asked that question, his heart was not right with God. It wasn't in line with what Jesus was about to do. Peter asked the question in the 13th chapter because in verse 33, he said, Little children, a little while I am with you, ye seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. And Peter asked the question only because he was interested in himself. Hey, Lord, why can't I come with you? 
That, that's what Peter was asking. Jesus could see right through to his heart. Why can't I go? You're going somewhere, Lord. Why can't I go? That wasn't... You see, Peter was self-interested rather than Christ-interested. Jesus just said he was going away, and the question could have been, Lord, whither goest thou? I'm concerned about you and what you're doing. What are you doing? Divorcing himself from what Christ was about to do. Now, let me put this in shoe leather for you because this happens in our life too. If you live a life like anyone else down here, things happen to you. Circumstances go on a daily basis about you. Circumference all around you. Circumstances are happening. Okay? I mean, things are happening at work. Things are happening in the family. Things are happening in your walk with God. Things are happening with the church. And often, you ask, Lord, why is this happening? Whither goest thou? But your question is self-interested. Why is this happening to me? Amen. Amen. <laughs> this is exactly what he's painting for you in these two chapters. I'm interested in me, Lord. And how rarely do we ask, Lord, why is this happening? What are you trying to achieve down here? What, what is the plan you're trying to do? Jesus, what are you trying to do? Whither goest thou in this circumstance? What are you doing? Because I want to get in line with what you're doing. Capiche? Amen. That's what's going on here. The words can be right, but the heart can be wrong. That's why we don't have creeds around here. Creeds become dead things that people read. God doesn't want a creed out of you. God doesn't want a prayer book out of you where you're reading someone else's prayers. The words could be right, but your heart is all wrong. God would rather have the words all messed up, but a heart that's right and trying to, making groanings unto him, you can't even get straight, but you're being heartfelt, honest with God and searching for what he's trying to do. And Jesus was able to say, you know, none of you said to me, no, none of you asked me whither goest thou. And Peter's thinking, I just asked that about an hour ago. Yeah, but your heart was wrong. You want to see another example of this? Go back to Genesis. I'll find you two chapters here. Genesis 17 and 18. It's the heart, folks. It's the heart. God wants your heart. Okay? He wants my heart. It's our hearts. The Lord looketh on the heart. The, the issue down here is our hearts. If we could just get our hearts right with God, not like a super saint, you know, we dress a certain way and our hair is cut a certain that that's super saint stuff. I'm talking if we could get our hearts right with God, it would, it would, first off, we'd be so close and so nigh unto God, the devil would have to flee from us because he's not going to get close to God. And it would keep our flesh under control. And we'd be so close to God, we'd be out of the world. I mean, almost all of our problems would be gone. But it's the heart. Let me show you in Genesis 17. <clears throat> um, Genesis 17, verse 15. And God said unto Abram, or Abraham, and he's together with him, the beginning of the chapter, he's Abram, now he's Abraham, just give him a new name. Said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, shall her name be, and I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her, yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Now, I believe at the time she was like 89 years old when he's making this promise, and she's never had a baby. She's been to all the best obstetricians, she's tried all the fertility programs, everything, in vitro fertilization, nothing's worked. 89 years old, it's over, she's way past menopause, tried all the hormones, it's done. And God says, you know what, she's going to have a baby. Next year I'm going to give her a baby. At verse 17, then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. And, and said in his heart, wow, shall a child be born unto him that's 100 years old? shall she, Sarah, that is 90 years old, bear. And he's, he's doing it. Now watch. Okay, so that happens. In verse 18, you see, and Abraham said more uh, unto God, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And then they talked about Ishmael for a while. So, God, so he laughs. Now watch the next chapter. Same thing. 
and watch the difference. Um, verse 9, And they, this is the Lord and the two angels, are visiting Abraham at his tent. And they said unto him, unto Abraham, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And then he, the Lord, said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Sarah was one of these. She's got her ear up against the keyhole. She's listening to the conversation. You know, she's eavesdropping. She's got the glass of water up there without the water, and she's listening to the whole thing. She wants to know what's God saying, okay? And, and when she hears this thing, she laughs. Uh, uh, Sarah laughed within herself, verse 12, saying, Man, after I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, uh, being old also? In other words, she laughs. Now watch the difference here. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And then Sarah denied, saying, Oh, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Now he rebuked Sarah for laughing, but he never rebuked Abraham. Both the same thing. Mm -hmm. Whither goest thou, whither goest thou? Laugh, laugh. One gets a rebuke, one doesn't. Why the difference? The heart. Abraham was not laughing at disbelief or in a mocking manner. He was laughing with joy. He had bubbled up to the point, like if you've ever had that happen sometimes, you watch, for me this happens, you watch a little child play with a kitten or with a dog. And then they do some things that are just so cute, like the kitten starts chasing his tail till he goes around and gets dizzy and falls down, and the baby falls down, and you just laugh with joy as you watch this taking place. Mm -hmm. That's an inner laughter of joy. It's not mocking them, it's a laughter of joy. That's how Abraham was. He was just rejoicing in heart that he was going to have a son after all these years. And Lara, or Sarah was laughing in mockter and scorn and disbelief. What does that mean? You and I really have trouble judging by outward appearance. So the Bible's giving us an x-ray here. Same type of thing is happening over there in John's Gospel. Whither goest thou? Whither goest thou? One wants to know what's happening to the Lord. The other wants to know what's happening to himself. Where's your heart on the issue? So go back to where we were in John. See, it's the heart. It's the heart. It's the heart. You and I need to search our hearts. We need to cleanse our heart and we need to pray that God would help direct our hearts into his love and into what he's doing rather than so much how it's affecting us. And then you recognize the circumstances, God's at work in the circumstances. If we wouldn't worry so much about ourselves, we could get involved in what he's doing. Peter was only interested in, hey, what about me in these circumstances? And so that's why Jesus said to him, I go my way unto him that sent me, verse 5, and none of you asking me whither goest thou, none of you are concerned about me. You're only concerned about yourselves. Amen. 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 I'm sorry, Lord. Amen. I get that way. I get that way a lot. I find myself on a daily basis like that, and I have to check myself and say, okay, Lord, forget about me. What are you trying to do down here? Why is it I have to work late today? Why is it that this thing broke down right now when I don't seem to have the time to take care of it? What is it that's going, what are you trying to... You know, am I supposed to call a repairman that needs the Lord? Are you trying to work something out here? Whither goest thou? What are you doing? Not for my sake, for yours and for whoever else you're trying to work and, and minister in, in behalf of. And Peter wasn't at that point. The disciples weren't at that point and probably were not a lot of times. But if we read these things and we meditate on them and we pray, he'll bring us to that point. None of you ask, whither goest thou? Verse 6, But because I've said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Because you're concerned about yourself and not me. I can't believe this is happening to me. I just can't believe it. Oh, my heart's so sorrowful over these things that are happening. Now, what's going to be the end result of what's going to happen? This is the night before the crucifixion. And they're concerned about themselves. Jesus is concerned about them too. The end result of what's going to happen, turn uh, back to the Gospel of Luke, the last chapter. He 
see, sometimes we get so caught up in the here and now, we lose sight of the eternal. We lose sight of the future. We, we have the greatest, I'm going to use this with quotes, we have the greatest religion on earth. Okay? We don't really have a religion, but if you want to call it one, because ours is rooted in what Jesus did and his present work and what he is going to do. And as long as we remember that this is one that's past, present, and future, we don't have to sorrow momentarily. Look at look what happens a few days later. Uh, uh, Jesus is resurrected, end of Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 51. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, verse 52, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. What's God's ultimate plan for you and for me? Great joy. Worship and great joy. Don't let the momentary tribulations and trials of the day bother your heart with sorrow when you know what the end result is. It's going to be worship and great joy. And when they do start bothering you, just pray about it. Just quickly offer up a prayer and say, Okay, Lord, get my heart right again so I can get back on, on your timetable because your timetable is one of worship and great joy. Ultimate, the destiny, the ultimate destiny is worship and great joy. <coughs> and get my heart going in that direction again. Verse 7. Sorrow filled their heart momentarily. Had they kept their eye on the, on the, the big picture and what was coming for them in the person of Jesus Christ and all his work, there'd been great joy. That's why the Bible keeps saying, tells us, keep looking up. Maranatha, looking to the blessed uh, Savior, the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to keep looking to the second coming. We need to keep looking to our Savior that's coming back. Waiting for him. Verse 7, so he's going through here. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. I love that verse. You can preach it. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Anytime Jesus speaks, it's nothing less than the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's the way he speaks. Jesus didn't have one idle word mixed in his conversation. <coughs> he spoke the truth at all times. Man, what a Savior. The faithful and true witness he's called in the book of Revelation. As for me, I'm kind of the pathetic and halting witness. He is the faithful and true witness. Nevertheless, he tells the truth. I'm praying that he can do that with me. He's having great difficulty. You can pray that for yourselves. We want to get to the point where nevertheless we tell people the truth. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. There's one of your big Bible words in the King James Bible, expedient. That's a, one of the big words you'll get in the King James Bible, expedient. It's only found seven times in the King James Bible. It is expedient for you that I go away. In the English, the derivative that comes off of it is the word speed. Speed. Expedient. Expedient. In other words, literally, it's a hastening. It's an urging forward. It's serving to promote or in advance an end. He's saying, look, at my going away is going to hasten and speed that which you need. It's going to advance the very end that God has for you. The circumstances that are, that are going on in your life, if you look at them through the right eye and ask what I'm doing in them, you'll see it will hasten and bring forth and advance the very purposes I want to achieve in your life. Expedient. Expedient. Paul uses this word, just turn there real quick, 1 Corinthians 10. It will promote the cause that God would have in our lives. God would like to effect change in us. First thing he effected was saving us from the penalty of our sins. The next thing he'd like to do for us down here is give us the victory over sin. Give us power over sin. That's what he's trying to do with us. So we're not always falling down and getting muddy in the, the cesspool of the world. I understand a little kid walks and trips and gets dirty, but if you teach him to, to walk right and you show him the way to go, you can keep him from getting that nice white suit dirty all the time. And that's what he's trying to do with us. Now, Paul uses this word expedient again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. He says, all things are lawful for me. I mean, I'm a born-again Christian. I can do what I want. I have liberty. But all things are not expedient 
For all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So he's saying, look, I understand, you know, Paul says you have a liberty to do certain things, but that doesn't mean it's going to hasten, expedient, it's going to promote or advance the cause and the end that God wants in your life. So there's that big word used again in the Bible. <coughs> See, when Jesus does something expedient, it's going to hasten your, your, your growth in the Lord. When you and I do something expedient, sometimes it will hinder our growth in the Lord. Mm -hmm. I said, we, we just don't have the mind of Christ. That's so we need him. Whither goest thou, Lord? <laughs> you know, help so I can follow. Help so I know what you're doing. Give me understanding. Go back to John 16. Now, here's the expedient thing. Yes, I'm going to leave you. It's the Last Supper. Yes, I'll be gone for a while. But my going is going to bring the Comforter. If I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, this is something that he had promised before about the sending of the Comforter. The Comforter had to come, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Go back to John 14, verse 17. If verse 16, just so you know, it's the Comforter. I pray the Father, he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit. The Comforter is the Spirit of Truth. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and here it is, and shall be in you. I need to go away so I can place him in you. If I don't go away to the cross, I cannot send the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit did not indwell anyone in the Old Testament. We looked at those verses. Get the tapes in John 14. That's why it said back in John chapter 7, verse 39, where the Lord Jesus Christ told them at the Feast of the Tabernacles, This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Ghost could not be given to dwell inside anyone until the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's expedient that I go away, because if I don't go away, I can't send the Comforter to live inside you. The best he can do is walk along next to you. And knowing you guys, you're liable to go in a different direction since you can't see where he's going. I need to place him in you. Aren't you glad you have the indwelling Holy Spirit? Amen. Doesn't it cry, Abba, Father? Isn't that one of the ways you know you're saved? Amen. Again, we're talking to uh, people of different religions. They have no assurance because they don't have an indwelling spirit. It, aren't you thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross and resurrected so he could send the Holy Spirit to live inside of us? Amen. Isn't it good to live in the age of grace, in the Amen. church age? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so first and foremost, he explained to them in the 14th chapter, and here, that that Holy Spirit would be a gift given to those that are His. But now He's going to go on in the next few verses, and He's going to say, you know, the Spirit has a work that He needs to do in the world. See, the Spirit's ministry is not just to the Christian. The Spirit is also ministering to the world. And now here is the teaching of what the Spirit does in the world. And when He is come, verse 8, He the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Three things, three ministries for the Holy Spirit here in the world. The ministry of reproving the world of sin, to reprove, to show them the truth about sin. Okay, Again, we, we talked about a plumb line. A plumb line is something that's perfectly straight up and down, headed right toward God. Doesn't vary by one degree, goes right to ground zero, right up there. And when something gets out of line, you line it up to that plumb line and you reprove it and bring it back in order. The Holy Spirit's job is to show sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what his job is. Now, if we can understand what he's doing, boy, we can, we can work a lot better with him. And he can work a lot better with us. If we don't understand what he's doing, we may be off doing all kinds of cockamamie things in the name of Christianity. And the Holy Spirit's saying, but that's not one of the three things I'm doing. And there's all kinds of cockamamie Christian things going on out there today. All kinds of clubs, and I'm talking evangelical groups. And they're missing these three verses. You want to get in line with what the Holy Spirit's doing. Unless you want to form your own brand of Christianity, which I guess most people want to do as I listen to the Christian radio. Mm. But, but here is what he's doing. And Jesus is teaching it. 
verse 9, of sin because they believe not on me. The, the first thing the Holy Spirit is trying to do down here to lost people is to show them their sin need. Now, I understand in the 1960s or 70s, someone came up with this concept of the four spiritual laws. And it's been circulated all over the place. And, and they tell, the, you'll hear it said, you can't get someone saved until they know they are lost. So you've got to let them know they're a sinner. You've got to give them the Ten Commandments. You've got to let them know that things are doing wrong. You've got to tell the sodomite you're a sodomite. And if you keep living like that, God's going to send you to hell. And if you keep living in adultery and living with that girl outside marriage, God's going to send you to hell. And all kinds of various sins that you're picking on. And that's not what Jesus said the Holy Spirit's doing here. He is not reproving people of sins of commission. He's reproving them of a sin of omission, not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. No. That's, That's what he's working on. You don't need to run around and give people Exodus chapter 20. That's Old Testament. You need to give them John chapter 3 Amen. and tell them they need to be born again of the Spirit. And for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten Son, John 3, 16, into the world. That's what he's doing. The Holy Spirit is to let them know it's not what you do that's going to send you to hell. It's what you don't do in not believing on God's only begotten Son that's going to land you in the wrong place. That's the unpardonable sin that the Holy Spirit's working on. <coughs> Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is trying to stop the Holy Ghost from doing his one job of telling you you need Jesus Christ and you need to be born again. He's not worried about the Ten Commandments. That was another dispensation and it failed. <coughs> he's got a new work going today. He's building a church and he's out there in the world saying, you need Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Ghost is saying. Of sin because they believe not on me. That's the unpardonable sin. God can forgive any other sin. Well, what if I take a, a, a gun and I go around and I murder people in New York City? And I got the whole city chasing after me for months and months and they finally capture me. And they don't kill me because they don't believe in capital punishment. And they put me in prison. And then someone tells me that Jesus loves me and will save me. And I go, but I've killed all these people. And he says, well, you don't have to be separated from God for those sins. You're only separated from God because you won't believe on his son. And I bow the knee to his son and I take Jesus as my savior. Then what happens? Then David Berkowitz becomes a child of God and a born-again Christian. That's what happens. Because it's not the sins that David Berkowitz committed when he was in darkness, in dead and trespasses and sins, that was, going to, that was going to separate him from God. The sin was not believing on Jesus Christ until someone came and told him that message that you need to believe on Jesus Christ. At that point the Holy Spirit gave him the next verse, which is righteousness. But the sin was not believing on Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's all you need to do. Look, folks, if you'll just go out and you'll work with people on that alone and lift up Jesus Christ and tell them about Jesus Christ, you know the Holy Spirit is working with you with everything he's got to bring them to conviction and a saving knowledge of the Savior. And when you're out there running down bunny trails of, well, you know, this sin, it says this in Leviticus about piercing your body, you know, and it says this in Deuteronomy about women wearing pants. And if you're out there doing stuff like that, the Holy Spirit's going, what's wrong with this guy? Doesn't he know what my ministry is? John 16, verse, verse 9. I'm trying to tell these people that they don't believe on Jesus. And they're worried about everything else. Let's, let's just run some verses. Let's look at this gospel alone, which is why this gospel is precious. Go back to John uh, chapter 3. The sin that the Holy Spirit's working on is not believing on Jesus. That's the sin that damns men's souls. And there's a Savior to save men. John 3, verse 15. 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Words are read. You know, the Holy Spirit says, Amen, Amen. I got to get that message out. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The Lord Jesus Christ saying, you're believing on me, you're believing on my Father, I and my Father are one. And the Holy Ghost is saying, Amen, Amen. That's the message I need to get out. And by the way, that comes, that's part and parcel of the message. When you receive that message, you learn God the Father, God the Son. God opens up the teaching of the Godhead, what's commonly called the Trinity, to you. I had no doubts about that when I took Jesus as my Savior because the Holy Spirit was confirming that to me. This is part and parcel of the message. Not a Unitarian God out there, but a God that has a begotten Son, a Father and a Son that are one, working together towards salvation. That's part and parcel of the message. John chapter 11. He'll reprove the world of sin because they believe not on me. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Resurrection isn't a process. Resurrection isn't in a religion. Resurrection isn't even on a particular day. I'm waiting for the last day. We'll all find out at the last day at the judgment. No. Resurrection is a person. I am the resurrection. It's Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost is trying to get people to a person, not to a process Amen. and not to a religion and not to a ceremony. And that's what he's doing. He's reproving the world of sin because they believe not on Jesus. They believe on anything but Jesus. Right. Well, you know, I got baptized. No, you're not believing on Jesus. I've been confirmed. You're not believing on Jesus. I've got my church membership. I'm a deacon in my church. I'm a, I'm a minister. I, I, I pass out the communion. What is that thing called? Extraordinary. Huh? Extraordinary minister. Uh, extraordinary minister. There's another term for that in the Catholic Church. These guys that walk around and pass out the... Eucharistic, Eucharistic, Eucharistic minister. I'm a Eucharistic minister. The Holy Spirit says, no, you're not believing on Jesus. Amen, amen. He that, uh, Jesus is the resurrection, amen. not that little wafer. That's right, amen. Not that mass, not that ceremony, not that sacrament. It's in a person. John chapter 12, verse 40. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. In other words, the, the, the teaching here being that it's believing on Jesus for the conversion. It's an understanding with the heart. Uh, look at John chapter 20. All through the scriptures, the Holy Ghost is trying to get people to be converted from whatever it is they're believing in into believing on Jesus Christ. People are blinding their own eyes and hardening their hearts and not listening with their ears and they're believing on any religious system and, and the Holy Ghost is trying to get them to believe on Jesus Christ. Uh, John chapter 20, uh, verse uh, 31. But these are written, and remember, no prophecy is written except by the Spirit of God, holy men of God moved, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. And so the reproving work of the Holy Spirit is one to give people saving faith. And you see it all through the book of Acts, chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 13, chapter 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the work that the Holy Spirit's trying to do. He made it so easy for us. He said, look, let's just, let's just narrow it down to one thing and one thing only. Let's, let's get all the chaff out of the way. Let's just get it right down. Let's get the hammer and go right on the head of the nail. Jesus Christ. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You must be born again. You must be a born again Christian. You must be born of the Spirit. You must have Jesus as your Savior. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus Christ. And that's the only message you need to go out with. It's a one note samba. Okay? Real simple. That's all it's needed. And that's what the Holy Ghost is doing. And the devil has put a symphony of false religions out there, a cacophony of other teachings out there. And Jesus says, I want to make it easy for you, my disciples. Let me tell you what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's trying to reprove the world of sin, a sin of omission, not believing on me. I'll take care of all the other sins. Just get them to me. Amen. Isn't that easy? Amen. Isn't it great to be saved? Isn't it great Amen. to have this? Is, this is so simple. Amen. A child can do it. A four-year-old child could reprove a 65-year-old college professor. You need to be born again. You need Jesus as your Savior. That's right. Amen. Who's he to talk to me like that? He's got the Holy Ghost backing him up. Amen. That's the sin that's being committed today, is not believing on Jesus Christ. But he's not done with that ministry. Let me show you what else he does. When he comes, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness. Verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Now notice the personal pronouns in that particular uh, verse, referring to Jesus. Me, myself, and I. There's an I, there's a my, and there's a me. One, two, three. And righteousness is found in that person with the three pronouns. I, me, and my. It's my righteousness. I go to my Father. It comes by me. Who's the only righteousness that God accepts in the whole universe? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. There is no other righteousness. It's Jesus' righteousness. What, what about if you have the religion founded by Moses and you follow all the Mosaic teachings and you honor the Sabbath and you, you, you follow the righteousness of the Old Testament? Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Get your finger there in Jeremiah 23 and hold it and then back up to the book before it and go to Isaiah chapter 64. And then we'll read Isaiah 64 first and then we'll go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we, this is Isaiah, speaking to the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. But we, you, me, uh, hearken unto me, friends, uh, countrymen, fellow citizens of, of uh, Judea and Israel. We, all the Israelites, all the Jews, we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. We get blown away. So what about the righteousness of Old Testament righteousness? It's like a leaf that fades and gets blown away. It's like a filthy rag. Go to Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Jeremiah and Isaiah had an understanding that all the Mosaic teachings couldn't save their people. Good. They're smart. So who are they looking for? Jeremiah 23. Verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, with a capital B, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth, and in his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father. I, the Lord Jesus Christ. You call me Master and Lord. And right you are. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only righteousness that God accepts. Jeremiah and Isaiah had a prophetic picture of it. And now Jesus is here in the flesh manifesting it to his people. And he's saying, when I leave, the Holy Spirit will continue to pound that message home that there's only one righteousness that God accepts. Mine. No one else's. Go back to where you were in John. John chapter 16. Of righteousness... Because I go unto my Father. 
It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The problem is, we make measurements down here based on other people. And, and it's a natural thing for us to do. Because, you know, we see others and they, they're examples unto us. Many of them are bad examples. We see the news and say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to run around at a high school and, and kill people like a Columbine. There's many bad examples out there. Then there are good examples that come before our eyes. And we look at that good example and say, you know, there's someone I'd like to follow in their footsteps a little bit. They seem to have a right way of living. I'd like to follow that. And what the Lord wants us to do is to take our eyes off of people. And the Holy Spirit wants us to take our eyes off of people. Now, this problem has gone on for a long time in terms of looking at people. The Jewish people, especially those who were not teachers of the law, and that would make most of them, would watch the Pharisees. And the Pharisees appeared to live a righteous life. But Jesus told them one day in Matthew 5.20, I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Holy Spirit saying the righteousness is Jesus went to the Father. And we look down here and go, well, uh, let me think. You know that Mother Teresa, she lived a real good life. Jesus says, except your righteousness exceed that of Mother Teresa, you're not going to heaven because she's not going to heaven with her righteousness. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit will tell you there's only one righteous person. The righteousness is I go to my Father. I'm the only one to ascend into heaven. It's my righteousness. It's no one else's righteousness. The righteousness of the Old Testament Jews wasn't sufficient, and the righteousness of any New Testament religion or religious person or pope or saint or Mother Teresa is insufficient to gain entry into heaven. And the Holy Spirit will confirm that message in a, in a split second if anyone would dare speak it. Amen. Some of us just have to state the obvious. I hope you do. The Holy Spirit will confirm it. The righteousness is Christ's. The righteousness is Christ's. He's the only one. I, me, and my. He says three times in that verse. It's the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter uh, 3, Paul says in verses 8 and 9, Yea, doubtless, I, the Apostle Paul, I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Now think about Paul. Paul was trained up from the time he was a little boy. His parents dedicated him unto the Lord, sent him off to, to a rabbinical school when he was very young. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He worked his way up through the ranks of the rabbis, up to the point where he was a member, uh, a training member of the Sanhedrin. And he was, gonna, he was in line to be a Sanhedrin member. So, so in modern terms, it would be a little boy, he's sent off to uh, a seminary, he's going to be a priest, he grows up and he's working his way through Monsignor and Bishop, and now he's one of the cardinals, and he's in line to be the next pope. This is Paul, okay, equivalent. Big shot religious guy. And Paul says, you know what, I count it all loss, I count it dung. There's the verse. Philippians 3.8, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that righteousness which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. And the Holy Spirit is attesting to that. That's the righteousness that he's attesting to, is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And everything else, filthy rags and dung. Don't you love the Bible? I love the way it speaks real plain. You know, it doesn't mince words. It tells you how it feels about us. It talks about the glory of God and the sinfulness and the wickedness of man. And about someone that's bridged the gap named Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit will confirm and attest to that. He'll reprove the world of the sin of not believing on Jesus and the righteousness that only Jesus goes to the Father. He says, I go to my Father. Turn to Psalm 85. I go to my Father. Where's the Father? He's in heaven. Everybody knows that from the Old Testament. Psalm 85. <clears throat> Verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace 
have kissed each other. Watch this. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. He says, I'm going to go away. It's expedient that I go away. And he was, in the, was he in the ground for three days? Did he spring out of the earth and look down from heaven? There he is. There's the righteousness. There's the truth springing out of the earth. And there he is looking down from heaven. He's the only one to make that, that clean you know, trip all the way from top down and back up again. He's the only one to do it. Only the Son of Man. He had told that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? Haven't you read the Psalms? Don't you know this, Nicodemus? John chapter 3. Out thou mast ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. That's the only righteousness that's going to heaven. You're not getting there any other way. And the Holy Spirit is confirming this constantly. He's reproving constantly. But you know what? He needs some of us to put a voice to it. Jesus is the Word, but we're supposed to be like John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness of religions and deceit and falsehoods out there. And if we'll put a voice to it, the Holy Ghost will confirm and reprove that which we say. He says, and, and by the way, another uh, quick reference, go to, to Romans 10. We're going to have to end with this verse, and then we'll get last, uh, next week on the Prince of the World is Judged. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend unto heaven. In other words, look, at, if you go by a righteousness of the law, you're going to look around and go, gee, I wonder who will make it to heaven. Mother Teresa definitely make it. Yeah, she's going to do okay. She'll ascend into heaven. She was all right. Yeah, Mother Teresa's okay. By the way, they asked the American public, who's most likely to go to heaven? Number one answer, Mother Teresa. 90% of the American public said Mother Teresa go to heaven. 90%. More than anyone else. More than the Pope. More than presidents. More than anything. 90%. If for any one person. Who do you think is most likely to go to heaven uh, uh, of anyone in the world that, that you know of? Uh, Mother Teresa. When they asked that question, that was the number one answer in terms of a, a particular personality known. And the, and the Bible says, <laughs> the righteousness of faith doesn't speak that way. It doesn't say in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That's not how it works. The righteousness of faith knows that Jesus Christ is the only one that can ascend to heaven. No one else gets there. The righteousness of the law may talk that way. Gee, I wonder who's good enough to make it. But the righteousness of faith knows nobody's good enough to make it. All have sinned and come short. Come short of the glory of God. Glory of God's in heaven, and guess what? You come short. I made it as high as the Empire State Building, and then I went down 101 floors and crashed on the concrete. Okay? That's about it. The righteousness of faith understands only Jesus makes it, and the Holy Spirit confirms it. The righteousness of the law thinks somebody else is going to make it. By the way, funny thing, when they ask those people, they are the same, same poll, how many of you believe in heaven? Only 59% believed in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and then they asked them, are you going? And 91% thought they were going. They even thought they were better than Mother Teresa, when asked particularly about themselves. So 91% were going to a place that only 59% believed in. 32% were going to a place they didn't believe in. That's how they make their vacation plans. <laughs> I'd like to book a trip to Atlantis. <laughs> I tell you, sin makes you think funny. All right, look, we're running out of time here, so next week we'll continue on. Uh, we'll, we'll continue on these verses. I got to mark this because I want to show you about see me no more. All right, amen. Any questions on what we're looking at? Let's just thank. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just want to make a comment. The thing that you, I think, drove home, which is so important. Yes. We may say, uh, I don't need to do such and such because I've accepted Jesus into my life, into my heart. Yes. It's knowing that Jesus ascended to the Father. It goes beyond just accepting Jesus in your heart that makes you go to heaven. You have to know that Jesus ascended to the Father, and Jesus being your Lord is how you get in. 
the cup of acceptance is at the Seder is what taught me. Oh, I that. see, I see. Amen. 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 Accepting him, uh, understanding that the Lord Jesus is the only one that, that ascended into heaven. You need him in your heart if you're going to make the trip. If he's not in your heart, making the trip without you. He's your ticket. Yeah. Amen. And because he's already ascended. To the Amen. Amen. He has ascended. He's at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's thank him. Father, thank you so much for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. That, that reproves the world of, of sin and of righteousness. Help us, Lord, to work with your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord.